Thanks for tuning in. This is episode number 150. I want to thank you for taking the time to join me on this episode. I pray that it's a blessing. I pray that it speaks to your heart and mind and that God gets glory through it. Now, this is a particularly challenging one. Uh, This is a teaching that I gave here locally uh, in my own church body uh, amongst some in attendance. So, Um, It is very personal, um, but I think also applicable to many of the church at large. So I just, I pray that it it helps you, uh, strengthens you, and challenges you uh, that I'm confident of. Um, I'm calling it Worship the King. So before we begin, let's just have a word of prayer. Father, I thank you for your love and your mercy, your goodness and kindness. I thank you for your long suffering. I thank you in your just innumerable ways that you bestow your goodness upon us. I pray that this word would plant deep in our hearts, in our minds, that you would show us your ways, teach us your ways. And I pray that everything that we would do and give to you would be pleasing. To you, I pray, I pray that going forward we would have a transformation in our hearts and lives that can only be traced back to your grace and your goodness. Open our ears and our hearts to receive what only you can provide. And I pray that the Holy Spirit would enable this to go further than I ever dreamed or imagined or hoped, and that it would have a profound impact upon your body, and even those who would become a part of your body. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So as I said, I'm calling this message, uh, Worship the King. Now when it's time to worship in a corporate gathering, what do you think on while it's happening? Does your mind race Do you think on the things that you have to do for tomorrow? Do you just watch the people who are leading in music? Are you thinking the music is too soft or too loud? Are you thinking about building repairs? Are you thinking about who hasn't been nice to you in months? We are distracted by many things, but one thing is needed. Now, I won't ask you to raise your hands or to signify who was here or present, but think back to this previous business meeting. We began in worship, and after the first song finished, I look around the room, and rather than see people engaged in worship, I see most people looking down at the financial sheets. We have the opportunity to enter into the courts of heaven by worship, and many chose to see the financial reporting of the church. Now that grieves the Lord. Eighty to ninety percent of the people in that room that night broke the Lord's heart. How, you might say, Rather than be captivated by his face, we were captivated by finances. Now, if you're in a place where you can, you can turn in your Bibles to Luke 10, 38, and we will read through verse 42. This is Luke chapter 10, starting in verse 38. And it says, Now it happened as they went that he, Jesus, entered a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me 
helps to serve alone. Therefore, tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed. And Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her. Now notice that Mary was at Jesus' feet hearing his word. We find Mary seated at Jesus' feet, hanging on every word, interested only in staying fixed upon him. She was intentionally fixed upon Jesus. Now, keep that in mind. That was step one, fixed on him. What I want you to see through Mary is that it is her worship and adoration that propels her into her outward acts of adoration. Her posture of fascination, adoration, and worship of Jesus enables her to react rightly during given situations. It's from our right posture of worship that everything flows from. Now, when I say worship, don't just limit that to what happens on Sunday morning and night and Wednesday evening. We find our next story and example in John chapter 11, starting in verse 14, and then we'll skip to verses 17 through 35. John 11, starting at 14, and this is dealing on the death and the raising to life of Lazarus. Now, as you hear the words of Scripture, allow your mind freedom to imagine the very thing transpiring. Starting in verse 14, it says, So then he, Jesus, told them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Okay, now skip down to verse 17. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now, Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. After she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked, Come and see, Lord, they replied. 
Jesus wept. So here we have a broken-hearted Mary and Martha, both experiencing the loss of their brother Lazarus. When Martha hears that Jesus is coming, she went out to meet him. But Mary stayed at home. That's interesting, isn't it? Martha went out, but Mary remained. Martha gets into a discussion about end times resurrection, completely missing the point that Jesus himself is the resurrection and the life. Martha then affirms her belief in Jesus as both Messiah and the Son of God, then went back to call her sister Mary. She tells Mary that the teacher is here and is calling for her. Do you find it odd that she had just affirmed that Jesus was the Messiah and Son of God, but she refers to him, she refers of him to, to Mary as the teacher. That seems a far jump down from Son of God. Does it feel different to say the Son of God is here and is asking for you? Nevertheless, notice Mary's response to Jesus' calling. She got up quickly and went to him. Pay close attention to verse 30. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. What does that show us? Jesus was waiting. He was waiting to be come to. He called and he waited. He does the same with you and I. He calls and he waits. Will we come? Will we leave the place where we are to go to the place where he is? Quit trying to say he is everywhere and I need not have to go anywhere. He calls and we will either come or not come. Notice this in verse 32. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet. Once again, we find Mary at his feet, a place of recognizing him, Submission, a place of brokenness, love, and adoration. Stop caring what you look like. Stop caring what others may think. It's not them we seek to please. They are impossible to please. God is pleased when we come before Him in truth. We are fickle and untrustworthy. God is constant and true. Now take note, I'm not portraying Mary as a perfect person because when Lazarus dies, she says what her sister Martha says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Think about her and Martha's statement, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Is that a true statement? I don't think it is. Could Jesus have kept him from dying? Of course would he? I don't think so. Now, why do I think that? John eleven fifteen tells, Jesus tells his disciples, for your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe. What in the world does that mean? It was God's desire to raise Lazarus after four days. If Jesus was present while Lazarus died and then leading up to the fourth day after, I believe that some or many disciples would have left Jesus. Their faith in him would have stumbled and some, I believe, would have departed from his company. But not only just leave from the offense at not preventing Lazarus' death, 
What a statement of God's miracle-working power to raise a man who had been dead for four days. What a boost in their faith in Jesus after raising Lazarus. Remember, Martha, surely there is a bad odor, she says. Jesus isn't moved by that. Jesus can take what has been dead and decayed and bring it to life with only but a word. Lord, breathe on us, your people, the word of life, your very self. Now notice, lastly, in this story, in verse 33, when Jesus saw her, it's Mary, weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Can you feel the moment? Can you feel the pain, the disappointment, the loss? Can you feel the anguish that Jesus felt for those that he loved? Martha got into a discussion about theology and end times, but Mary fell at his feet weeping. This posture did something to the heart of God. So Mary was first found at his feet, intent on focusing on him. Then we see her again here at his feet. And it's from that place that resurrection life is expressed in the person of Lazarus. Now, the last story I want to highlight is one page over in John chapter 12 in the story of anointing. John 12 verses 1 through 3. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here, a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Now a dinner was given here to honor Jesus. We find Martha serving once again. But I want to bring attention to Mary. In the midst of a dinner to honor Jesus, Mary gave something of great value. She didn't keep it for herself. She didn't use it to make herself smell nice. Notice she poured a pint on his feet. That's a lot of liquid. We may even call that excessive. Was that much really needed? She felt he was worth the excess. We too need to see Jesus' worth as worthy of our excess. All these three scriptures illustrate the place of at Jesus' feet, which correlates in worship. First, there is intent. This is Mary seated at Jesus' feet, intentionally remaining and being fixed on his face and his word. Second, there is responding to his calling and moving his heart through your heart. This is Mary quickly going to him when he called her and falling at his feet in tears, which moved the heart of Jesus. Third, there is the pouring out of the perfume of your praise upon him and giving yourself fully to adoring him. This is Mary pouring her perfume in excess upon the one who is worthy of every drop and more. You may think, well, 
The last story doesn't say that she fell at his feet. How low would she have to get to use her hair to wipe his feet? These three phases in worship align with the prayer, Our Father who art in heaven, holy is your name. It's intentionally recognizing him, responding to the magnitude of his great name, and giving yourself fully, even excessively, to the holiness of of his name. Notice that from these three postures that we find Mary in, the last one is the lowest and most undignified, but also the one that Jesus came to her defense in saying, leave her alone. As we more rightly perceive Jesus, the lower the place we take, We stop trying to portray a facade. We strip away every dignity that we are entitled to. And our sole desire is that we may be close to Him and do our very best to honor Him. If we interacted with someone we thought highly of, if we got to converse with our favorite president, actor, actress, business leader, deceased or respected and loved family member, would we be so casual, so nonchalant, or even disregarding or dishonoring that person? Why are we so with God? Surely He is worth more honor and adoration than they My hope in this teaching is that you've seen through these scriptures the three postures that we must maintain for appropriate worship. Number one, intent to stay focused and fixed on Jesus' face and word at his feet. Number two, running to Jesus when he calls and falling at his feet, which moves his heart. And number three, offering to Jesus the excessive and expensive perfume of our adoration and affection and making oneself low. Then as we leave those encounters, we come back smelling like him. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, I thank you for your word that it's everlasting, that it's depth and width we cannot explore fully to its end. But we thank you for the magnitude of it. We thank you for its effect. And I just pray that this word goes deep in every listener's heart and mind. I pray that it searches us out. It reveals to us the weaknesses in our worship to you. I pray that it reveals to us those places that we have neglected or taken for granted. I pray that we would be intentionally focused and fixed on your face and your word that we would run to you when you beckon us and that we fall to your feet that our heart would move your heart by right worship and right intention. And that I pray that we would then offer excessively and without hesitation our adoration, our affection, that we would make ourselves low. And then in doing so, we come back looking, smelling, more like you. I thank you for your love and your mercy. And I ask you to bless every person listening to this and reveal yourself more deeply to them day by day. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. If it means that I'm close to you I would trade a million lifetimes for a moment here with you